So, good evening. Welcome. Welcome to the final lecture of ACT Spring 2015 lecture series towards civic art. I'm Gedimino Surbonas, director of the program in art, culture, and technology at MIT. In 2005, when the Monday night lecture series was launched, it aimed to bring together artists, cultural practitioners, and scientists from different disciplines to discuss artistic methodologies and forms of inquiry at the intersection of art, architecture, science, and technology. Over the last 10 years, we have developed a series expanding our scope, continuing to invite the critical thinkers and cultural producers of our time to come together to address current issues and contemporary challenges. Continuing on with this tradition, our Spring 2015 lecture series towards civic art investigates the critical spatial practices that claim manifold definitions of public art through a diverse array of visual forms argued by key practitioners across the disciplines of art, pedagogy, architecture, and urban studies to identify the tools, tactics, and consequences of actively reclaiming public space. The title towards civic art is borrowed from Georgi Kepesh text published in 1972 and alludes to the artists and cultural producers grappling with complex systems when addressing environmental crises as well as crises in politics and democracy. Kepesh wrote, today artists, like the rest of us, face a profound crisis brought about uh, by the increasingly dynamic complexity of our social fabric. Meeting its challenge requires their fundamental reorientation in order to probe, scan, discover, absorb, change, and re-edify their surroundings. They must transform themselves as well as the social framework of the creative process. This imperative refers not only to the exploration of new tools and media, but also to the exploration of new ways in which the work of art and the public can come together. The urgent issues Kepesh saw emerging in the 60s and 70s still persist today. Kepesh's vision of artists and cultural producers responding to relevant contemporary issues on a civic scale is fundamental to the practices of the speakers who have been invited to participate in this series. Tonight, I have a pleasure of introducing artist and ACT alumnus Michael Rakowitz. Michael, <laughs> Michael uh, lives and works in Chicago. In 1998, during the, his studies here at MIT, Rakowitz initiated Parasite, an ongoing project in which he custom builds inflatable shelters for homeless people that attach to the exterior outtake vents of the building's heating, ventilation, or air conditioning system. Michael's work has appeared in venues worldwide, including Documenta 13, PS1, MoMA, Mass Mocha, 16th Biennial is Sydney, 10th Istanbul Biennial, Sharjah Biennial 8, Tirana Biennial, and Transmediale 5. He has had numerous solo exhibitions at venues including the Tate Modern in London and Lombard Fried Gallery in New York. He is recipient of 2012 Tiffany Foundation Award, 2008 Creative Capital Grant and Sharjah Biennial Jury Award, 2006 New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship Grant in Architecture and Environmental Structures and the 2002 Design 21 Grand Prix from UNESCO. His work is featured in major private and public collections, including Museum of Modern Art New York, Kabul National Museum, Afghanistan, and UNESCO Paris. In 2011, Michael commissioned by Creative Time for his project Spoils, a culinary intervention at New York City's Park Avenue restaurant that invited diners to eat off of plates looted from Saddam Hussein palaces. The project culminated in the repatriation of the former Iraqi president's flatware to the Republic of Iraq 
at the behest of current Prime Minister Nuri al-Maliki on December 15, 2011, the date coalition forces left Iraq. Enemy Kitchen, an ongoing project started in 2003, is a food truck serving Iraqi food to Chicago's hungry public, stuffed by veterans of the Iraq war working under Iraqi refugee chefs. He is currently working on a new commission for the 14th Istanbul Biennial. Tonight, Michael will discuss his work in the context of hope and antagonism and at its intersection of problem solving and troublemaking. Please join me in welcoming Michael Rakowitz. Wow, um, it's so nice to be back and so unnerving to be back. Um, it's been 17 years since I've been here, which means I have like six new images to show you. Um, I want to start by thanking Yeraminas and Nomeda and, um, and Azra. Uh, I want to thank Amanda Moore and uh, Andrew for helping uh, me get here. And um, uh, it's really, really fantastic to be here. I want to also thank the students who so courageously presented their work today, which is all in progress. And I know what a vulnerable space that opens up. And so I want to thank you for welcoming in, welcoming in, welcoming me into such a vulnerable space. Okay. So in 2008, I spent a great deal of time in Redfern, a largely Aboriginal neighborhood in Sydney, Australia, producing a project that involved indigenous citizens and organizations from that community for the Biennale. I was struck by the overt racism in the city, the ongoing crimes against and the displacement, displacement of native Australians now, now 248 years running. But there was something done as protocol that I felt kept the problems and failures visible and made them present, something I've tried to do in my own work for the past decade. In Australia, the acknowledgement of country is usually a statement or a speech made by an Aboriginal or a non-Aboriginal to show respect to the traditional custodians of the land. I've often believed that the best way to forget someone important is to name a building after them, so their name disappears into an address, into the architecture. I'm sure that similar things have been said about the acknowledgement of country. But as an outsider, I was incredibly moved when I heard this preamble spoken at every public speech. I thought about my own context as an American living on indigenous land taken from its original inhabitants. To live up to my commitments to the citizens of Redfern, I made a promise to myself that I would continue to remind those who had forgotten. Since my return to the US, I have begun all my public lectures with this, an acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and pay our respects to the elders, both past, present, and future, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture, and hopes of Native America. We must always remember that under the concrete and asphalt, this land is, was, and always will be traditional indigenous land. So I'm from Great Neck, New York, um, a little town on Long Island. And uh, why Great Neck? So when my grandparents left uh, Baghdad and they emigrated to the US, they ended up in New York City for um, a short period of time, uh, during which they met a Syrian man who said that a really great place to go and buy a house would be Port Washington, Long Island. And so my grandfather was directed to take the train, the Port Washington line, which is like the red line in New York, it's the red-coated uh, uh, train line. And he took it from Penn Station. Uh, Port Washington was the last stop. He fell asleep on the train, not knowing that Port Washington was the last stop, got out of Great Neck, bought a house, and that's all, how all the Iraqi Jews ended up in Great Neck. <laughs> so I grew up looking at these houses, these very nice houses in this suburban part of New York. And this is Six Gateway Drive. Uh, which was um, a home for two years to F. Scott Fitzgerald. And it was in this house that he seeded the, uh, the idea for The Great Gatsby. 
And so uh, the West Egg was supposed to be Great Neck, where East Egg was supposed to be Manhasset, Roslyn, Port Washington. This is Andy Kaufman reading The Great Gatsby from cover to cover as one of his sort of uncomfortable stand-up comedy routines slash performance art. He actually was also from Great Neck. Uh, my mother used to point him out to me at synagogue during Rosh Hashanah and say, you know, that's the guy who makes you laugh so much. That's the guy who lip syncs Mighty Mouse on Saturday Night Live. This is a house that you can buy right now in uh, Kings Point on uh, just, you know, part of Great Neck. Um, and this is that same house juxtaposed with one of Saddam Hussein's palaces in Iraq. So that's about all you need to know about me. So I often get asked to participate on panels about what does art do and should it do anything at all, which is always you know, such an aggravating set of questions that I feel furious enough that I have to participate. And, um, and so it's uh, resulted in me thinking about some of the things that I think um, uh, Gediminas was, uh, was alluding to in his introduction about civic art, but also about the way in which it engages how art can engage and possibly change a public, produce a public, even dismantle a public. Um, so there are many doings in art. Uh, inducing a profound aesthetic experience is a doing and a difficult one at that. And I firmly believe in the autonomy of art and its resistance to being um, instrumentalized or becoming utilitarian. I think there's room for that and that, uh, the, that in itself is a kind of radical gesture. But to speak more personally, I come to art from a background in, in design and architecture with their expectations of utility and function. Thus, in my work, doing has often been a critical moment. Art is shelter, art is para-archaeology, art is radical commercial enterprise. In 2006, the sustainable architect, Tony Fry, told me that this approach was illustrative of what he calls redirective practice, a cultural practice that's bridging disciplines and aiming towards ethical directional change. And so the way that he described it to me was that it means moving beyond your kind of like native, native training um, and actually engaging with other, um, with other sort of fields and other training uh, in a way that doesn't abide by orthodoxies and that you get to make mistakes and then engage and possibly change those other practices. And the move beyond disciplinary confinement can yield dramatic results. And for me, this is always rooted in some sort, sort of uh, a failure, um, often camouflaged by layers of efficacy. In each of these endeavors that I described, I'm also consciously constructing a kind of failure and critique of problematic mechanisms. Uh, my old mentor, uh, Christoph Wodichko, who we all saw last night um, with his amazing projection and, and at, uh, at Harvard, uh, calls this particular strategy, one we share, scandalizing functionalism. It names a place where problem solving is also troublemaking. And so in the context of this, it's uh, important for me to go back to my time here and this is a uh, parasite, which uh, Gandaminas described before, a series of custom-built inflatable shelters that I designed for homeless people that attach to the ventilation on buildings so the warm air leaving the building simultaneously inflates and heats these double membrane um, structures. And so the homeless person is never actually coming into contact with the air. It's circulator, circulating around them in this kind of network of tubes so it heats through conduction. And this was for Bill Stone, who requested a shelter with two layers of uh, windows if he was sitting up and lying down. This was a shelter designed for George Livingston. And I couldn't help but take a bit of a nostalgia tour uh, through Cambridge the other day when I landed. So, you know, there's an, actually no ventilation left at that building. And so um, George wanted a series of air ribs interrupted by Ziploc bags in which he could put objects uh, that belonged to him and regulate the levels of privacy and publicity. So it became a kind of a reliquary for the objects that are part of a homeless person's everyday life. And this is two shelters that were set up at the MIT Plasma Transfusion Laboratories, which was just down near the uh, train tracks. I don't know if it's still there. We got two shelters off that one vent. Um, the guys who I was working with told me that this was the vent that blew the hottest and the hardest in all of Cambridge. They actually started to map the topography of the city. Uh, based on this warm air leaving buildings. 
This is Bill on the left, George Livingston on the right with uh, Bill's shelter. Bill on the left, George on the right, in the middle is Freddie Flynn, who's responsible for the most difficult shelter I ever had to build. It turned out he was um, a big science fiction fan, and when Bill and George told him I built anything he wanted, he said anything. And what I didn't know was that he was a huge science fiction fan, and so he came to me with this torn out piece of a magazine with a picture of Jabba the Hutt and said, I want to live in this. <laughs> uh, he said, I did an okay job. And so when the project moved to New York, I found that the, um, the, the, the New York Times, when they wrote about the project, contextualized it with Giuliani's anti-homeless laws at the time. And one of the homeless people that I was designing for, Michael McGee, who's pictured here, found that the anti-homeless laws were connected to anti-camping uh, laws, and the anti-camping laws were connected to anti-tent laws. And a tent was actually defined in the bylaws of the city that he looked up at the New York Public Library which stated that a tent was defined as, as a structure standing about a meter tall and capable of housing somebody underneath it. And so he started to play this kind of Simon Says game with the city and says, well, what happens if we bring the design of these things lower than a meter? You know, what if it's 18 inches off the ground, then it becomes in, undefinable, like an inflatable sleeping bag or body extension. And so here you can see him anchored to the uh, building, almost like a mermaid. And so that was a period where the police arrived and initially uh, was asking what we were doing and found out that the project was the one that he had heard about on the news and went on to, uh, to give us all the time we wanted to take our photographs as a way of, of, of sort of participating in his own sort of subterfuge against these laws that he didn't believe in. He went into an anti-Giuliani rant and then he gave me a critique on what I could do to make the project better. <laughs> And so um, this shelter was designed for Artie and his girlfriend, Myra. Um, Artie was about 60 years old at the time. Um, he requested a shelter that allowed him to have this, uh, this, this sitting area that was about a meter tall, and then a low-lying area called the Lovin' Room, which was the Lovin' Room. And uh, about midway through building it, he called me and uh, told me that I needed to stop and that um, you know, it wasn't going to work. Myra talks way too much. And so what I needed to do was to design it so it looked like a bra or a dog bone. So there's two sitting areas. And so this project that began as a project about architecture quickly became also a project about portraiture, where the, uh, the, the, the shelters wore the needs and the desires of each inhabitant as a way of uh, communicating back to a public in a way that wasn't always so um, uh, clear but it, uh, the expression came from their own sort of sets of uh, guidelines, which was not the way I was being taught in an architecture studio here um, at MIT. And so this project is one that's continued over the years. I do it every winter. One of the ways that the project has evolved over the years is that the step-by-step -step instructions on how to build a shelter have appeared in these newspapers that homeless people often write the editorial content of, and they also sell them. So I think in Boston, I think it's called Spare Change. And in, in Chicago, we have one. Uh, in Berlin, it's Motz, and in Montreal, it's Itineraire. And so they get printed in the winter, and then there's usually an editorial response written from the perspective of a homeless person. So useful art, as Tanya Bruguera has termed it, um, arte utile, um, has a long and robust history. As Tanya notes on her 2011 website, the Useful Art Association, of which I'm a member, the Argentinian artist Eduardo Costa published a manifesto of useful art in 1969. In it, he describes a project in which he used his own money to replace missing street signs in New York City and to repaint the 42nd Street and Fifth Avenue subway station, all to attack the myth that art lacks utility. Conversely, the rendering useless of useful objects, first seen in Duchamp's ready-mades, is a radical undoing. The spirit of Duchamp's reciprocal ready-made, in which he proposed using a Rembrandt as an ironing board, is, a, is revisited in one of Tanya's own works. Taking up the claim that useful art needn't be, simply be the beautification of already useful things, we might better term this design or decoration, and that usefulness itself can be beautiful, Bruguera declared that the time had come to return Duchamp's urinal to the bathroom. And that's just what she did at the Queen's Museum of Art. In Tanya's own words, you can go there, see it, and pee on it. 
Much of the work that I do aims to create a third way, to make problems visible, to interrupt silence, to present an impossible prototype showing how things could be. Most of these projects engage to one extent or another in real life moments outside the gallery or museum context. I'm interested in work that does not become art too quickly, that can exist in the space of the real. Take for instance my favorite painting, one that I have come to call Orange. In November 2004, during the Orange Revolution, named for the color of the popular opposition, Natalia Dimitruk, the sign language interpreter for the Ukraine state television channel, was told to interpret the false announcement that Viktor Yanukovych was the winner of the widely contested presidential election. Instead, she tied an orange scarf to the inside of her sleeve, revealing it with every hand gesture and deviated radically from the script of the live televised broadcast. A flash of orange. I'm addressing everybody who is deaf in the Ukraine. Our president is Viktor Yushchenko. Another flash of orange. Do not trust the results of the Central Election Committee. They are all lies. A final flash of orange. I'm very ashamed to translate such lies to you. Goodbye, you will probably never see me again. The ones to hear the truth first were those who could not hear. And so for me, this particular episode is really important because it actually is located in a space of historical failure. We all know that the Orange Revolution ended up not being such a great thing, um, but it also was a gesture that had emboldened other journalists in Ukraine to go off script, and their decision to tell the truth, to speak truth to power, is credited you know, very much to the way in which uh, Yushchenko eventually did emerge as the winner. But we all know that Yanukovych is back, and um, so things are a little bit different. You might have a perspective on this that well, you can correct me at the very end when we do our Q&A. Um, but it also, for me, shows the way in which these projects can work as a way of creating publics and communities and, and, and uh, uh, kind of loose affiliations of people who are trying to do the same thing by doing these sort of public acts. So when I was going to school here, one of the things that terrified all of us as students because the project, uh, the, the program was a public art program, was the idea of uh, showing in a museum, which in one way seemed uh, really taboo. Um, but I've come to understand museums, thank God, as, uh, as public spaces as well. Um, one of those museums that I visited in 2006, uh, a little bit late in my life, um, was uh, the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, which of course is notorious for housing the Pergamon altar, uh, which was taken by the Germans and uh, from, uh, from Pergamon in what's now Turkey, and, uh, and installing it in the museum in, in Berlin. What I didn't know was that it also housed the Ishtar Gate, um, which was built in 575 BC by Nebuchadnezzar and was kind of like uh, the central feature of this, uh, the ancient city of Babylon. And uh, the magnificent blue gate was brought brick by brick back to Berlin by the German archeologist Robert Koldaway and installed in the museum. And any missing bricks were reconstructed by the museum staff so that the, the gate would give you the sort of full on um, grandeur that might have appeared in, uh, the, the way that it might have appeared in ancient Babylon. It was through this, uh, this, this gate that ran the processional way, which was used by the citizens of Babylon, by the priests during the New Year celebration, um, on which they brought the statues of the uh, worshippers and the gods to and from the Akito temple, the Akitu temple in the north. Um, the name of the street uh, was Ajibor Shapu, which translated from the uh, ancient Babylonian means the invisible enemy should not exist, which is like the coolest name of a street that I've ever heard. And it's uh, like a Jenny Holzer truism. And it's also the name of this project. In 2007, if you looked up Ishtar Gate, this is what came up. This was a plaster plywood and two by four uh, reconstruction of the gate. Uh, that was taken by the Germans in the early part of the 20th century. It was commissioned by the government of Iraq in 1950 and was most, it was supposed to stand as the entrance to a museum which was actually never completed. It became uh, one of the most popular photo ops for American soldiers who stand in front of it in their sort of hi mom, I'm in Iraq moment and 
you know, Flickr has thousands of these images. So these, um, these episodes are reconstructed through drawings that I made that in one way or another allude to um, the frames of a kind of storyboard for a film, but also to the kind of diaristic sketches that many of these archeologists made in their, uh, their journals while in Iraq and divvying up the artifacts of the past. And the Iraq Museum was looted um, uh, from April 10th to 12th, 2003. Uh, 2003. Um, one of the world's great collections of ancient artifacts, including the Vorka Vaz of Uruk from the fourth millennium BC and thousands of ancient stone cylinder seals, monumental Assyrian reliefs from the royal palaces of the first millennium uh, BC and a vast collection of in inscribed clay tablets that are among the earliest examples of writing ever found were potentially wiped off the face of the earth. Um, the museum was pillaged from the 10th until the 12th of April and, uh, and it was short, shortly after the fall of Baghdad and display cases were empty, dropped artifacts were damaged and storage vaults were robbed. And so many of these missing items have since been recovered through international policing and amnesty for looters. Um, as I started to kind of zoom in on the story, one of the, um, one of the articles that caught my eye was one that really kind of humanized um, this, this unspeakable tragedy and one that actually enhanced the, um, the affect of what I felt was the first moment of pathos that opened up in the war. And it didn't matter if you were for the war or against the war, this wasn't just an Iraqi problem, this was a human problem. These are the first examples of, like I said, writing, the first code of urban laws. Um, so it was a kind of elemental moment in our collective history that was at risk. Dr. Donnie George ser served as president of the Iraq State Board of Antiquities and Heritage and director general of the National Museum in Baghdad. In the aftermath of the museum's looting, he worked tirelessly to help recover some 50% of missing items. However, because the museum continues to be a soft target for insurgents, international policing agencies from Kuwait and Iran to Japan, Italy, and the US are for now retaining any confiscated museum objects. Under Saddam Hussein, Dr. George took part directly in archeological excavations in order to avoid Ba'ath Party meetings. And one of the things that projects like this do for me is that they start to kind of surface uh, a kind of uh, learning that isn't possible when you only read um, the text in something like a journalistic report. And when I started to engage with people in the Iraq, muse Iraq Museum and later with Dr. George himself, he explained that this tactic was a form of circumvention. He was an Assyrian Christian and in order for him to hold the, um, the, the office that he had in the Iraq Museum, he had to be a member of the Ba'ath Party which went against his own politics. And so in order to avoid meetings, he would do something that no director of a museum would do, which was to participate directly in the excavations and telegraph, you know, we found something awesome in Tel Asmar. I'm sorry, we can't, I can't be at the meeting in Baghdad. Dr. George also sidelined as a drummer in a band called 99%, short for 99% of excellence that specialized in covers of Deep Purple and Pink Floyd songs. <laughs> And this is where I really fell in love with the man. He was like an artist. Deep Purple Smoke on the Water recalls a disastrous fire during a 1971 Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention concert at a casino in Montreux, Switzerland. A fan shot a flare gun inside the venue. A fire ensued and the entire building was destroyed. Members of Deep Purple watched the events unfold across Lake Geneva in a mobile studio on loan from the Rolling Stones. It's all in the song. If you listen to the lyrics, it's all there. After receiving a letter with a bullet enclosed from extremists who threatened to harm his family if a ransom was not paid, Dr. George resigned his post, fleeing to Syria in August of 2006. In December 2006, Dr. George arrived with his family in the United States, having accepted a position as a visiting professor in the Department of Anthropology at the State University of New York, Stony Brook. Ahlan wa sahlan, Dr. George. And so this, uh, these drawings are not you know, particularly special in the way that they're presented. They're just on the wall of a gallery. But in the middle of the room is um, this ongoing project where I, along with a team of 25 assistants in Chicago over the years, 
um, endeavor to reconstruct the 8,000 plus artifacts that are still listed as missing, stolen, destroyed, or un unknown from Interpol, and also the Iraq Museum's own, own database. And so the artifacts are reconstructed to scale um, using um, packaging of Middle Eastern foodstuffs um, that are a kind of cultural fragment or remnant that one finds here in cities where there is an Arab presence. There are also the, uh, the newspapers that are printed in Arabic and English that are given away for, to, for free to these uh, immigrant communities. So it's about these uh, fragments of cultural visibility that are being enlisted to make these things that are, for all intents and purposes now, invisible. And so the artifact, the reconstruction, and it comes from this database at the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago, which has a long-standing relationship with the Iraq Museum since it was uh, in, in, um, incorporated in the 1930s by Gertrude Bell. And after the looting, they went live with this uh, website, this database where you could click on any number, and uh, whatever was in the Iraq Museum would come up. And there were two reasons for going live with this. One was to deter antiquities dealers who might be buying on the black or the gray market to be able to do a comparison. So it was a little bit like those missing children photos that were on the backs of milk cartons in the 1980s. Um, and then uh, it was also a way to educate the human public on how much cultural patrimony had just been wiped off the face of the earth. And so you can see here it has everything from the excavation numbers to the provenance and then the dimensions which, uh, along with the photographs from all the different sides, makes the sculptor's job pretty easy. And so the last moment of a kind of um, reconstruction here was the soundtrack that accompanies the work. And um, I mentioned that Dr. George was a member of 99%. Uh, and so an Arabic uh, band called Ayub in Brooklyn, um, I commissioned them to do a, an Arabic inflected version of Smoke on the Water that um, serves as a soundtrack for the piece, and I'll play a, a small segment of that here. The, art the artifacts were then paired with um, uh, quotes from different people reacting to the looting of the Iraq Museum. Everything from like Satan's favorite poet, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, who was remarking on like how could there be that many vases in the whole country, um, to somebody um, like Donnie George, who told the side of the looting that I'd never heard. Um, he says, this piece has a very nice story. It was taken by two young men during the looting. They took nine very nice pieces to their houses. They came to us after the looting and they said, don't ask for our names or addresses. We were in the museum at the time of the looting. We felt very sorry because we could not stop anything. Then they decided they would take things and bring them back when it was safe. And they did it. As soon as we had the American soldiers protecting the museum, they brought back the nine pieces. So Dr. George, as you know, arrived, as I said in the uh, drawings, in, in December of 2006. And this was all very coincidental. Um, I'd been following his story, but I didn't know that his arrival in the U.S. was so imminent. And so this project opened in June, uh, I'm sorry, January of 2007. So I started to get a little nervous that this guy was coming to a, from Iraq, running for his life with his family. And here's this weird artist doing this project about him uh, in Chelsea. And so um, it ended up being that he was really um, kind of interested in it and came to me and was really excited to meet me at this uh, event where it was very moving. Um, New York City's archeology span community had um, gathered to replenish his library 
with books because they knew that he couldn't travel from Iraq uh, with, with the books that he had in his office. And so he, he, the thing that he was most interested in was he, he said, where did you get a picture of me playing the drums? Because the art newspaper, which had actually followed his story from the beginning, um, printed this headline, you know, revealed Donnie George rock star. And uh, it had the picture of him playing the drums. And there's no YouTube videos of 99%. There's no MP3s. There's no Google images. And so I explained to him, you know, I went online and I found this picture of him looking kind of bored in a meeting. <laughs> and then a picture of this guy. And then through the magic of Photoshop, I created this base image. And then he smiled and he said, that's archaeology too. And um, the thing that was really kind of amazing was when I was in Chicago, I started to get these images. Hi. Uh, it's not my good side. Um, I, I started to get these images from the gallery in New York. Um, he started to show up at the gallery and gave tours to people who were visiting the exhibition the same way that he would have given tours in his own museum in Baghdad. And when I asked him you know, how he received the project, he mentioned how emotional he, he became. And he said it was because this was as close as he was actually ever getting to the artifacts again. It ends up being really you know, even sadder because Dr. George died in March of 2011. And so he ends up, like a lot of those artifacts, cradled uh, by a third party country, uh, too dangerous for, to, for him to return. And so, um, and so this is a project that continues and unfortunately continues even more as my assistants and I have started to make the artifacts that have been destroyed in the Mosul Museum and across archaeological sites in Iraq and Syria. The Iraq Museum and the Chicago, um, uh, University of Chicago's Oriental Institute asked me because of this research to please keep my eye out because I might be the kind of person who would see uh, a looted artifact. And I asked them where to look and they said eBay. eBay was one of the first places that the artifacts showed up and you can find Mesopotamian artifacts with regularity on eBay. So uh, being new to eBay, I just put Iraq as one of the keywords. And I started to get like a thousand emails a day you know, that would tell me when something from Iraq was listed and it's too general a keyword. Um, but I was like, looking to bid on things like the, uh, the timetables for Iraq, uh, Iraqi Airways, which reprinted a lot of the photos of some of these artifacts that the Oriental Institute didn't have access to. And I was always getting outbid um, because apparently aviation paraphernalia has a kind of subculture where people are willing to bid obscene amounts of money for these things, and I was always losing out. Um, but one day, I ended up with this very weird um, object in my inbox, and it was um, the Iraqi Fedayeen Combat Saddam Elite Combat Forces helmet. Another one described it as Iraqi Fedayeen Darth Vader War Helmet Special Forces. And it turned out that this was actually designed by Uday Hussein in 1998 at the behest of his father Saddam for the Fedayeen Saddam. They were a paramilitary group that would report directly to the Iraqi leader himself and not to the Iraqi army. It turned out that Uday Hussein was a huge Star Wars fan and had designed the uniform based on Darth Vader and the Empire in Star Wars. This was no joke. As I looked closer, it was clear that this was cast directly from a Star Wars um, uh, Darth Vader helmet uh, costume. Um, it even had some of the imprints of like the copyright on there. Um, and it was a non-ballistic uh, helmet. It was made out of fiberglass, the same fiberglass that's used in um, Charles Eames chairs. So it was purely for the way it looked and intimidation. And here's the comparison photo. These are not my photos. These are all from eBay, from different people who were listing this. So um, this became the, uh, and these are them in action. This became the, the crux for a project um, that was first shown in New York and then later at the Tate Modern in London. Um, this is Darth Vader being arrested by coalition forces. And when I started to read the testimonies from different soldiers who were on military forums, where a lot of these stories were being traded along with the, you know, these artifacts that nobody seemed to want back. Um, it was uh, the most surreal moment for them during the war. This was the last battalion to fall in Baghdad and for the American soldiers whose cosmology of good and evil was writ as thickly as it was by Bush, um, along with like the George Lucas, you know, 
good side and you know dark side of the force um, said it was uh, ridiculous to be seeing these Darth Vader's pop out from behind corners uh, shooting at them. And so this is one of my favorite photos of like the residue of these things. Um, just before I got to MIT, um, as a student, I read this book by um, Samir al-Khalil, which was a pseudonym for Kanan Mekia. He came out already. It was called The Monument, which was about public art, vulgarity, and responsibility in Iraq. And I was really taken with this sketch that Saddam made himself of the Swords of Qadisiyah monument, which you've all no doubt seen on the news, um, which was meant to commemorate Iraq's victory in the Iran-Iraq war. Um, and it immediately reminded me of the poster that hung over my bed uh, when I was um, in elementary school after seeing The Empire Strikes Back. So this is a, an illustration by Boris Vallejo, um, who ended up being the kind of mentor to uh, Rowena Morrill, who was a fantasy illustrator um, and was uh, one of the artists that Saddam Hussein collected. And so you can see her paintings in these, um, uh, these images. You must all somewhat remember this, but uh, in the aftermath of the liberation of Baghdad, they found in Saddam's palaces these love nests. And then Rowena Morrill started to make these claims that you know she wanted the paintings back, and it was right after the looting of the Iraq Museum. So the interim government said, "Get in line." Um, and so all of these insane connections, you know, started to sort of coalesce around um, this one moment that I had in 1994, 1995, when I first saw that monument. And then I spoke to the Iraqi art historian Nada Shabut. Um, who has been um, archiving all the modern and contemporary art in Iraq that's been looted. And she um, told me that the, uh, the, the Swords of Qadisiyah monument served as the backdrop in January of 1991, just before the Americans um, dropped bombs on Baghdad. Uh, Saddam had the entire Iraqi army marching underneath the Swords of Qadisiyah to the soundtrack from Star Wars on repeat over and over and over again for the television cameras. So that's three instances that made for a story that somebody had to tell. A lot of people hated it. Um, it began as a kind of comic book in Bedoun, um, where I illustrated these moments that nobody was around to photograph, but there isn't one ounce of fiction in this story. But like I said, somebody had to tell it. And, um, and so here you see the evolution of starting out on the battlefield with the samurai helmets and then the German style helm and the, uh, the mask that were the inspiration for Darth Vader's helmet, then Darth Vader, and then back to the battlefield. And then they were very worried that George Lucas was going to sue them at the Tate, and um, instead Star Wars Insider magazine ran a huge article on it. Um, so there was a, a kind of nice way in which the project found its way back into the cosmology of the storytelling, but then it also started to reappear on eBay. This is recent screenshots I took, and now when these um, helmets are traded online, they actually quote the, um, the press release from my exhibition at the Tate Modern, uh, giving it more uh, provenance, and they name all three incidences now. So it's sort of looped back into this other kind of public space that I'm very interested in. So being on eBay led me to this, um, the realization that on April 9th, 2003, was when the, uh, the Saddam Hussein sculpture in Ferdo Square was pulled down. We all know this was a highly choreographed event by the American army. Um, and, uh, and I became very interested in the aftermath photos. Um, being interested in public art and in sculpture and in monuments, I always look for those moments when those monuments can really speak back to a public. And so it was in the absence of Saddam Hussein's um, uh, body that I started to see the way in which the symbols of power were dispersed to the Iraqi public. And so here you see this man from Kurna standing on the top of one of Saddam's statues and reclaiming this as a space of power for himself. And then the shock and awe campaign led to the opening uh, for lack of a better word, of Saddam Hussein's palaces. And Iraqis uh, started to loot the palaces and started to use his objects like chandeliers and chairs as everyday quotidian objects in their own homes. Um, what I started to find on eBay, again, were like, what are the artifacts that nobody's trying to uh, reclaim? 
And I started to find the silverware from Saddam Hussein's palace, which were made by Christoffel in France. And um, at the same time that I was finding this, I was invited by Creative Time. I like working with suicidal uh, institutions, you know, the ones that uh, are willing to kind of do these impossible projects. And so I have to give them credit um, for um, being the only place that w would uh, go along with this. But I was invited to do a culinary intervention uh, in an upscale restaurant on the Upper East Side in New York that was called um, Park Avenue Autumn. And so Marina Abramovich had done Park Avenue Winter when there was a winter menu, and then uh, Paul Ramirez Jonas did the spring menu, and then Janine Antoni did the summer menu, and then I was slated to do the fall menu. And so they set up a conference call with me, the chef, the publicity um, uh, representative of the, of the restaurant group, and then also Creative Time. And so I told the, um, I told the chef, Kevin Lasco, uh, that you know, what I was interested in, 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 in these high-end restaurants, they always tell you where your arugula comes from. Um, they always tell you where your beef comes from. And it's a way of making the diner feel good. And I wanted to make the diner feel bad. And so I told them about date syrup. Iraqi date syrup is processed in the Iraqi capital. And it's driven over in large vats across the border to Syria, where it gets put into an unmarked can. And then it's driven over the border into Lebanon, where it gets labeled as product of Lebanon. And then it gets sold to the rest of the world. And this was a way in which the Iraqi companies had more or less circumvented the UN laws, uh, the sanctions against Iraq. Uh, from 1990 onward. And so this was, of course, 2011, and these were still laws that were very much in place de facto because anything leaving Iraq is subject to um, security searches here in the United States, which levies pretty huge fines, and so nobody in their right mind would import anything that says product of Iraq, um, except for me, and I'll get to that later. And, um, and so it, it, there's no date palms in Lebanon, so the date syrup can't possibly come from here. And this is Basra date syrup. We all know where Basra is. That image is actually a stock image that's used by the Iraqi date industry. And then it says product of Netherlands. And I've never seen a date palm in Holland. And so I told the um, chef that I wanted it just to sort of clearly say on the menu that there would be a dish that was made and it would say Iraqi date syrup. And he said, done. What do Iraqis make with date syrup? And I told him there's a dish called Deva Swarashi which is a dessert where you mix the date syrup with tahini and you dip fruits in it or you dip, dip uh, bread in it. And he says, I'm going to serve venison on top of Deboswarashi. So it's like the American deer hunt meets the Iraqi date harvest. <laughs> I said, beautiful. I said, here's the catch. On eBay, I found 20 plates that belong to Saddam Hussein. And the dish is going to be served on this. The dead silence. And then finally, the PR agent says, I think we're going to get a lot of publicity for this. In which case, I said, perfect. And so this is the result. This is the venison served on top of Deba Swarashi. This is me with Kevin Lasco. This is the hospitality plate uh, from Saddam Hussein's palace with the insignia. And then it turned out Saddam himself was a looter. Um, in, his, uh, in his cupboards, they found the plates that belonged to the Iraqi monarch. Uh, King Faisal II, who was killed when he was 23 years old in a coup. And uh, he was fascinated with King Faisal. That's King Faisal with Jackie Robinson in New York. Um, and then these are two Kuwaitis eating off of Saddam Hussein's plates. Now, this is how my, so the project is really meant to kind of like, you know, investigate this troubled triangle of the, din the diner's tongue, the sweetness of the date syrup, which is usually the harbinger of good things to come and has a lot of metaphoric value in Iraq, and then the bitterness of the surface, which is twice bitter. It's not just the surface of Saddam Hussein, who we know uh, was not an angel, but it's also getting to you through the vulgarity of the American war, and then the occupation, and then the subsequent um, execution of the leader. And so, in as much as the project is about consumption, it's also about refusal where the diner actually, actually has to perform their ethics. And this is how my work gets reviewed these days. This is the New York Post. Saddam does the dishes. Um, two days before the project was supposed to end, I received uh, a cease and desist letter from Co Cox Padmore, Skolnick, and Shakarchi. The email actually came from the State Department. 
um, telling us that the, and this is the subject heading of the email, surrender the Iraqi plates belonging to Saddam Hussein. So even the inanimate objects were given enough agency that they had to surrender. And so um, I said, that sounds perfect. This is the perfect end to the project. I can't believe you won Saddam Hussein's uh, dishes back. That's fantastic. All I want is to be able to film the repatriation ceremony. And whenever any of the artifacts are found in other countries and they decide to repatriate them to Iraq, there's usually a ceremony. And, uh, and I wanted to be part of that. And they said, no problem. It turned out that they wanted it a lot sooner than we had planned for. They initially said January of 2012. And then I was in New York um, in December of 2011. And uh, Ann Pasternak from Creative Time called me and very nervously said, are you in New York? It has to happen tomorrow. So I ended up at Creative Time's offices uh, and helped pack up the plates. This is a US Marshal investigating the plates and confirming their identity. And I'll let the video do the talking. In this way, I think the project follows through with a lot of the traces that I was interested in, in terms of where the object went, where it belongs, um, the history that's loaded uh, inside of it. I'm somebody who doesn't believe in the destruction of monuments and in the tearing down of symbols of power that people uh, may have resisted or may have resented. Um, I think that's part of a place's history. And I think that when those symbols are erased, you're dealing with um, an unhealthy amnesia that countries and people tend to um, fall into. I'm dropping them off right now at the, uh, to the Iraqi uh, embassy. Embassy. Yeah. Uh, the Iraqi Iraq 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 with that, where the Iraqi PM was in town. Yeah, just yeah. uh, with Obama. Obama. <laughs> he got me on Bush. So he was hoping to bring them back on his uh, trip back. Wow. So I don't know if it's going to happen that quick or not, but that's why they wanted that's to do it That's why they wanted it to, to Wow. Quickly. Yeah, it yeah, came all the way from uh, DC to request to get this done today. I was a little bit surprised that the Iraq mission to the UN would want back the symbols that the US and many of the people in Iraq had seemed so eager to uh, dispel and to destroy. The address of the Iraq mission to the UN is 14 East 79th Street. We're standing in front of the Iraq mission to the UN, and we're here because the US Marshals are turning the plates over to the Iraqi government. Um, what they told us in Creative Times offices was that they wanted this to coincide with Prime Minister Nuri al-Maliki's visit to Washington. He was in DC yesterday meeting with President Obama. And uh, they're looking to bring the pla plates back home to Iraq on the same flight as the current Iraqi Prime Minister. I think the way that embassies and missions work is that you're technically on the Iraqi soil, uh, or you're on the soil of the country of the embassy, and so uh, we're on Iraqi soil. This is the first time my family's been back. <laughs> So they'll be returned to Iraq? Yes. Tomorrow? Yeah, we don't, I'm not sure, but very soon. Okay. Very soon. Will it go to a museum? Or yeah, it should be. It should be, be. Okay. yeah. What I heard was that the plates were a gift from the Queen of England. That's right. Wedgwood China. So, And then the, uh, the more recent China, all different places, Limoges, Italy. Thank you so much, okay. and okay. good luck, Thank you. Thank and you inshallah, Thank good you. times ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I, I had no idea. I honestly thought that we would be in some kind of office where people were getting passport visas or something else, and I never expected this level of uh, the state presence. I mean, these, these 
people walking in and out of the room, opening the door, shutting the door. It was like a striptease. And then... So, that's the ambassador's staff with the plates. And then, um, on December 15, 2011, they announced the end of the Iraq War and the troops coming back. It wasn't a yes-men project this time. And uh, the very bottom of the front page is this picture of the uh, plate contextualized with the handing over of the sovereignty um, to Iraq. Best new thing in the world today is obviously the end of the Iraq war. Uh, Defense Secretary Leon Panetta saying today in Baghdad that Iraq is now fully responsible for directing its own path. The war ending as it should. Iraq now becoming its own sovereign country without our flag flying over it anywhere, without our troops anywhere in it. That's easily the best new thing in the world, maybe this decade. But there's another Iraq story that is ending as it should. It doesn't beat the end of the war, but it's pretty good. Um, this fall, a Chicago-based artist got together with a New York City arts group and a restaurant. They put together an ambitious, big-thinking art project. They found on eBay dinner plates believed to have been looted from Saddam Hussein's palaces after the U.S. invasion. They bought the plates, and as an interactive art installation, they served on Saddam's flatware and plates venison with tahini and date syrup and pomegranates. The project was called Spoils. The artist said he wanted diners to think about how the plates got to their table. Quote, this is about the symbols of power in that regime that have now come into the ownership of the populace that were living under Hussein, he told the New York Times last month. But you can't just buy Saddam's dinner plates on eBay, not legally anyway. When the art group was formally notified that the plates really belonged to the Iraqi people and needed to be returned, they agreed to give them up. So earlier this week, in what the New York Times described as a strange but cordial visit, the artist helped the U.S. Marshals pack up the plates so they could be delivered to the Iraqi mission at the U.N. By Tuesday afternoon, the plates had made their way to D.C., where Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki was in town to meet with President Obama. The plates were then scheduled to fly back to Iraq with Maliki on his private plane on Wednesday, which is to say this ambitious, big-thinking art project ended as it should have. The Iraq war is over. Iraq is a sovereign nation. And one of the very small things that means is that they get their stuff back, too. <laughs> now it's time for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Have a great night. So, um, you know, the, uh, one of the things that happens in a work like this is that, um, you know, it, it ends up becoming part of a, a larger story. And the story that I was actually the most interested in was the fact that they wanted the, the symbols of Saddam's regime back. And one of the things that I explained last night at dinner with um, the ACT faculty was that uh, when you think about the symbols that Iraq has adopted since, you know, stepping towards sovereignty, they took the flag and they removed the three green stars. And those three green stars were a pan-Arabist symbol that emerged in the 1960s when Iraq wanted to join the United Arab Republic uh, that was um, under the umbrella of Nasser's Egypt and Syria. They had the two stars, which Syria still has as its official flag, and Iraq put the third star with this kind of utopian hope that it would join this kind of pan-Arabist uh, state. They removed those things, but they kept the calligraphy that Saddam Hussein wrote in between in 1991 that said Allahu Akbar. You know, so for me, it's interesting that these symbols end up um, being repatriated, and um, the subcutaneous layer of what that means is one of those um, one of those histories that I think has yet to sort of surface as a kind of critique of um, the, uh, the American invasion and the sanctions and um, the years through which Iraq has been dehumanized and villainized. Um, going into more culinary projects, um, it's important just to kind of cover one of the topics that Gid Aminas mentioned in his uh, opening. This is my grandmother um, in the middle, Renee Shamoun. Um, from Baghdad. Uh, the photo, I think, is from the 1930s. Um, to her left, or to, her, to our left, to her right, is her sister Marcel, and um, that's their friend Leonie. And so I grew up in my grandmother's house hearing these amazing stories about Baghdad. One was about a scorpion that lived in the basement, and I liked scorpions when I was a kid. She also told me stories about the singing towers that told the time. And for a kid who had a lot of troubles with numbers growing up, the idea of somebody singing the time was a lot uh, more interesting to me than learning how to read a clock. 
And what I found out over the years was that she was talking about the minarets and that she kept time as an Iraqi Jew living in the capital, um, hearing this kind of religious sound, which was very much a secular sound. It was very much a part of public space. And so in 1991, um, about seven years after my grandmother passed away, the first images that I saw emerging from this kind of magical city that she told me about were these, the green tinted CNN images of bombs falling and destroying pieces of architecture that I would never see. And this was the first political moment in my evolution as a human being was the moment uh, when the place that my grandparents fled to was about to bomb the place that they fled from. And as soon as these images came across the television, we were sitting at dinner watching it happen on TV and my mother blocked the TV, turned to me and said, you know, there's no Iraqi restaurants in New York. And I didn't know what this meant. This was like a riddle. I didn't know if this meant that she was going to quit working my dad's office and uh, open up a restaurant um, or if this meant something else. And clearly what she was saying was that Iraqi culture was not visible beyond antiquities, oil, and war. And I'd grown up with the only context of Iraq in the news being the previous eight or nine years um, in the Iran-Iraq war. This is my, grandma, this is my mother um, and my family, and this is uh, her cooking during um, Rosh Hashanah. Um, typical dishes that are found in other uh, kind of Middle Eastern cooking, this is mashi, or as the Iraqi Jews call it, mhasha, the stuffed uh, grape leaves and, and uh, eggplants. This is um, a, a kubba dish that's made with uh, uh, pumpkin. And so I started to think about what my mother said about the fact that, um, that there was uh, no Iraqi restaurants in New York. And I started to think about the cultural puncture that gets created as a result of war. And one of the things, again, that I mentioned last night at dinner was that you can't walk very far in Paris without coming across a North African market or um, North African restaurant, which is very clearly a kind of uh, mirror image of the way that uh, French occupation and war has happened in that continent. And um, we don't have the same geographic proximity to Iraq here, um, of course, but it, it, it kind of made me think that one of the modes of resistance should be that an Iraqi restaurant should be open on every corner in American cities. Um, on September 14, 2001, I was walking in New York just shortly after the attacks, and I saw a line of people that went um, two blocks around uh, St. Mark's Place. And at first I thought it was a blood drive or a place where people were going to donate boots for the rescue workers down at um, Ground Zero, but instead they were actually lining up to go to Khyber Pass Restaurant, which was an Afghani restaurant, still exists in uh, Manhattan's East Village. And the people online w were you know, waiting to go into the restaurant because it's the only thing that they could think to do as the war drums began to beat. And it was also a reassurance for the family that was running the restaurant. And I, this, I found this very moving. And it wasn't long after that that I decided to launch Enemy Kitchen, which is an ongoing collaboration with my mother where we cook uh, and teach, we teach and cook Iraqi recipes to different public audiences in the United States. And this is probably the most interesting audience we had, which was a group of two teenagers in New York in 2006, um, many of whom were living in the projects in Chelsea. If you go down 26th Street, as you're walking towards the galleries, there's housing projects there. Most of them were Latino and African American, and most of them had family who were stationed in Iraq. And um, the principals in their schools had uh, told the professors that they couldn't bring up um, the Iraq war in the classroom, that it was potentially too incendiary an issue. And so um, I thought this was really damaging because in 2006, if you think about a kid who's 12 years old or so, they've grown up a good half of their life now living in a, a war culture. And so um, my idea was to just kind of present the cooking classes as a way in which an encounter could be created where they were employing a kind of sculptural technique to make these uh, dishes um, and then they would just speak. 
and they were fearless. Um, one student walked in after three weeks of making this and said, we make this nasty food, um, they blow up our soldiers every day, and they knock down the Twin Towers. And so my, I, my agenda was not to mediate, it wasn't to proselytize, I just kind of wanted to create a space where fearless listening could enable fearless speaking. And so they said, um, this other kid said, it wasn't, it wasn't the Iraqis who blew up the Twin Towers, it was bin Laden. And then another kid from the stove says, it wasn't bin Laden, it was our own government. So in this one moment, you have the panoramic snapshot of everything from like uh, this sort of purposeful misinformation, the completion of Iraq with 9-11, the mainstream uh, belief, and then the conspiracy theory, which is still a very healthy space to be in, actually. And after 10 weeks of teaching these students how to cook um, Iraqi food, they said to me, you know, this class is ending and we know all about your food, you don't know anything about ours. Couldn't we teach the last class? And so I fantasize all the time about like, you know, the class without a teacher, or like the students taking over. Um, and so I said, of course, absolutely, it makes a lot of sense. And then they said, uh, do Iraqis make fried chicken, southern fried chicken? And I quickly did this Rolodex spin through my mother's recipes in my head, and there's nothing like fried chicken. And they said, well, we're going to invent Iraqi fried chicken. So in the next week, they taught me how to do a sort of uh, soul food shake and bake. Uh, they marinated the chicken in um, date syrup, uh, in baharat spices, and seasoned it the way that one would season Iraqi meat. Uh, and then Iraqi fried chicken was born, you know. <laughs> So I've done this project over the years, and I think in the context of a talk like this, it's important to also talk about the things that don't work. And as I've done this in more sort of like a, a th you know, art institutional settings where the people who are coming in just reflect your own politics, you know, there's, there's no friction there. There's no potential for any kind of movement. And so this kind of antagonism that I'm interested in was completely absent. And so I've stopped doing it in um, art institutions. This is um, the Memorial Day barbecue that the Iraq Veterans Against the War asked me to cater in Chicago at the, at the Veterans Art Museum. And so instead of there being hot dogs and hamburgers, the veterans got together and were making kofta and kitri and all other kinds of Iraqi um, food. And so it was a very somber experience. And then once the, once the beer got going and we were by the grill, uh, the Vietnam veterans who were there also turned to the Iraq War veterans and said, you know, who would you try first, or who would you hang first, actually, uh, uh, Kissinger or Rumsfeld? And so it became, it became this really sort of like interesting intersection between these two moments in American history now where an entire generation and their, um, their families have been exposed to this kind of uh, shame. And so this is uh, the current evolution of Enemy Kitchen. It became a food truck in 2012, um, and uh, it's staffed by Iraqi um, refugees as uh, the chief chefs, as Gediminas mentioned, and um, the sous chefs and servers are Iraq veterans, so it essentially inverts that power dynamic in Iraq where the Americans are finally taking orders from the Iraqis. Now, Chicago has really draconian laws as it comes, when it comes to food trucks. You can't um, cook on the truck and you can't park anywhere within 200 feet of a restaurant that includes 7-Elevens and school cafeterias. So there's like very few places you can go to. So it really is a contested space in and of itself. So we felt like those trucks that Colin Powell said were all roaming through the Iraqi desert with the weapons of mass deliciousness. And so um, here you can see the Iraqi flag, uh, not the Iraqi flag, that's the Chicago flag rendered in Iraqi colors that confused a lot of people. It's now been adopted by the Chicago um, Iraqi refugee community. Um, as their, their symbol. Um, now in Chicago, it's not the same thing. There's a huge Iraqi community. Um, so there are Iraqi restaurants, but they don't announce themselves as such. And the restaurant I partnered with as the host kitchen, and who now own the truck, was a place called Milo's Pita Palace, or Milo, Milo's Pita Place, which says fine Mediterranean cuisine. But then the dead giveaway is when you look at the menu, they have dishes like masguf, or even the Cornish hen, um, or kubba, which are the sort of like uh, dead giveaways that it's an Iraqi restaurant and Iraq doesn't border on the Mediterranean. So, you know, the reason they shield themselves is obvious. You know, they talked about the, the xenophobia 
that um, is visited on the Iraqi community. And this became a big coming out for not only them, but the Iraqi restaurants in Chicago who started to also say, well, we're Iraqi too. We're kind of enemy kitchen too. Um, and so one of the things that also happens on the truck, this is the whole staff, this is the chefs and the, um, uh, the soldiers. Oh, and one thing to mention is the guy who took this photograph um, is a veteran and is now an artist. And a lot of these veterans have started to become artists now too, which is a really interesting um, coda to their history. Um, but uh, this woman, Sabah uh was a refugee. And on the truck, she started to talk to the soldiers and say, you know, what, what areas of Baghdad did you guys patrol in? What, where were you? And so one guy mentions some place that's close to where she lived. She goes, you know, there was an armored carrier. I remember they used to like hold up traffic all the time. It was a huge pain in the ass. And one day, somebody just started dancing on top of the truck and it made all of us happy. And so this guy, Greg, who took the photo here, and you can't see him, says, that was me. So it turned out that uh, one of the people in his battalion had received one of those uh, Santa Clauses uh, that dances, I guess, and plays digital music. And, um, and he was sick and tired of being over there, sick and tired of be feeling betrayed, like what he was doing was just making things worse. And as all these cars are beeping and they're pissing off the local community, he got out of the truck and had the guy down below hold the Santa Claus to the microphone that was uh, part of the loudspeaker and started dancing. And so the two of them came together. He started wrote, writing poetry for her called, I Dan uh, uh, there was a very beautiful one called I Danced For You. And they started doing these sort of photographic pairings together. So it opened up these other spaces where my presence receded and they started to really kind of become uh, the producers of content um, on the truck and so the, the food itself um, was served on paper plate replicas of the Saddam Hussein hospitality plates. Um, the minimum order was 50,000, so I'll be having barbecues for the rest of my life with Saddam Hussein's plates. This is in Chicago. And so this is how you see, you know, it unfolds. Now, one of the things that happened in the build-up to this, I, I've realized now looking at this lecture that there's a lot of media and press, but we ended up getting a two-page spread in Chicago's Time Out food and drink section, which pissed off a lot of chefs, because um, we hadn't even taken to the road by this time. And so here we are posing in front of the truck before we painted it green. and. Um, and so this ended up bringing a lot of people not only to Milo's, but to other Iraqi restaurants. And so there's always a question of sustainability with these projects, you know, like continuing it, you know. But I also think it's important to know when to kind of disappear. And a lot of the projects that I'm interested in doing is about a certain kind of ghosting, you know, making an apparition appear, and then any good apparition always disappears, you know. Um, but it's also a question of like, you know, sustainability can be an oppressive term. It sort of like, you know, puts a lot of expectations that you follow a business model and that you become a successful business and you stay. But I prefer to think about evolutions, you know, how, they, how things transform and mutate. And so as a result of this project, Milo's Pita Place became really popular. And their desire wasn't to run a food truck. It was actually to open up an Iraqi nightclub. So Milo's Pita Place became Milo's Palace. They bought a huge space, and they started to employ only singers who were incredibly famous in Iraq. Ali Rashid, on the left, won Iraqi Idol in 2005. Um, Wali Lasmar is beloved in Erbil, and Milad Yunus is the one person who's sort of building his reputation. So it employs these people who come over who don't have any other recourse. Um, so it does kind of set up these things, these microeconomies and these evolutions that I'm very interested in. And so, you know, let's listen to some more music. This is a typical night at Milo's Palace. <laughs> Whenever I 
guys see that video, whenever I go to Milos, and I, I go a lot, um, I'm always taken uh, by the fact that these are Iraqis smiling and having an awesome time. A lot of them are from the north. They're deeply affected by everything that's happening here. Every weekend I go and I, I inevitably meet new refugees who are fleeing ISIS. And so, um, I don't know, maybe that's a good place to end. I sort of DJed a little bit. I didn't want to do a canned talk. And again, Aminas was telling me how Kshistov's last talk was all DJing. And so I moved around a little bit. I don't know how far we got, but uh, I don't know. Is it, do you want to stop? I don't know. Yeah? Yeah. Speaking about art and real, um, you mentioned um, uh, Tane Bruguera and you mentioned the, the art util or the useful art. And we have this ongoing discussion uh, in the studio and, uh, and, is, and especially in the, in the seminar on public arts, public, public sphere, um, um, as we also discussing arts relationship to economy as well and, and, and your work, uh, what we witnessed tonight, you know, uh, uh, specifically deals with what you describe as microeconomies or these kind of like uh, narratives um, that uh, perhaps uh, override, you know, the grand kind of like narratives of economy, right? So opening up new alternative avenues mm. for the economy. But, uh, but getting back to kind of like, you know, to this uh, idea of art and the real, uh, um, how real is that? Well, I, I think it's I think it's very real. I mean, it's there, and you know, I like. Uh, I think real is uh, a relative term, of course. You know, it's um, I like a lot of invisible art. Um, I like a lot of work that's uh, conceptual and propositional and um, aspirational, but doesn't yet exist. I mean, I, that was one of the reasons why I loved. Um, architecture so much was because uh, um, so much of the the really um, impactful work that I was drawn to was the stuff that was never built. Um, the stuff that was limited by the forces of gravity or political situations that wouldn't allow for a Yona Friedman city to be built. Um, I think all those things are real though because they move me in these directions that that I ended up going into. Um, and so I think that, you know, it, it's again like the presence of the sign language translator being able to do something that's impossible in that moment, but through a moment either of subterfuge or circumvention, or in this case, like the propositional, and it ends up being impactful. And it may not be impactful on quantifiable levels that would say that, you know, this thing yielded this change here and that changed the history of the of the world i mean and it you know but i'm also you know for me the scale is it doesn't matter if it's incredibly um atomic or if it's uh or if it's collective or if it's uh on a global level you know so i think that you know the space of art you know or or the question of whether you know is art real i mean of course it is. Um, I think it also opens up that radical space of the imagination. I mean, it was Magritte who said, uh, no matter what oppressive circumstance he lived under in Europe, they could never colonize this, you know? And it might sound trite and a little bit too utopian or romantic, but I believe that, you know? So I don't know if it's an answer to the question, but, uh, but I think that... Um, you know, sometimes uh, the work that doesn't necessarily want to be implicated in world events and and uh, and other things are um, are just as as real. Uh, there's a lot of people who don't want artists to do what they do. You know, and especially in this own in our in this country as well. And so, 
you know, being uh, a creator, not a producer, um, is, uh, is a radical act in and of itself. A lot of your work uh, also um, functions and acts as, uh, as what is called realpolitik, right? Mm. The, the politics uh, that, uh, that perhaps based on, uh, on the power and the practical and material factors rather than uh, ideological uh, notion of moral or ethic. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, you know, if you could kind of like uh, unfold that. Yeah. Say the last part about morals and ethics again. Right, because, you know, even with, with, your, with your proposition uh, of a troublemaker, mm -hmm. right, you know, or kind of like, or the, or the dinner that, you, that you're describing as, as disruptive, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, you kind of like working this thin line, you know. Like, yeah. Uh, and uh, and this thin line in, in, in some instances or some projects that kind of kind of perhaps also can lead you into the into the court or right. the lawsuit. Right. Right. And yeah. in some other instances, you know, into this kind of like larger questions on morals or ethics. Right. Yeah. I mean, how do I unfold that or unpack that? I mean, um, I'm interested in in asking these questions of why, you know, like, you know, in, in a lot of cases, the, uh, the, the research that was done by Michael McGee, the homeless person that I worked with in, in New York that I showed images of, um, he, um, you know, he was actually able to answer some of those questions of why uh, that led to uh, a how-to, you know, how, how, you know, the city says this, you know the uh, uh, the code, the architectural code says this, and then you design in between. You know, um, and so I'm interested in not necessarily blatantly breaking a law. You know, like for me, going out and simply breaking a law is just too direct an approach. But um, finding moments that allow for porousness or agility um, that wouldn't normally um, you know, come to the surface as one of those places where you can, you know, move things around in a city and end up with the real questions, you know, about like who owns warm air coming out of a building. You know, thankfully that's not been regulated. Um, you know, those kinds of things uh, end up being like really fertile spaces um, for me to imagine, you know, a, a city's future without government, you know. Um, and, you know, when it comes to the, the morals or the ethics, I mean, that's where I'm really not interested in, in essentially creating a, uh, you know, some sort of, um, model, you know, um, I want to question those very things, but it's not as though I'm, you know, poisoning everybody with ricin, you know, when they're eating the, you know, the, 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 the venison. Um, I'm actually trying to create tensions through which people start to regard the provenance of their food and then also the objects on which the food is served. Um, and then that ends up connecting everything. And, um, and so when, when those things are performed, you know, that's where I think things happen and things start to really get discussed and otherwise you say real politic, and then I think about also politeness. <laughs> and the one thing that I am dead set against is polite art. Um, and, uh, and for me that, um, you know, the, 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 the idea of the reconstruction of the Iraq Museum and creating those artifacts, you know, the place where that project really comes from is a frustration with making work for a commercial gallery. And I consider myself a site-specific artist and one that does deal with uh, public, but um, I'm also represented by a gallery and therefore I have to acknowledge the fact that there are site-specific problems that I need to address. And so in 2006, and JSL, maybe you can say something about this or whatever, but you could go through Chelsea and not know we were living in a war culture. And that really bothered me. And um, and I wanted to make a corrupt object. Um, and I thought about the way in which the Iraq Museum was looted. 
And it was the existence of a market that allowed for it to be looted. And the existence of the contemporary art market made it possible for me to introduce these reconstructions that would be for sale that end up being these kinds of like surrogates for the actual thing. And many of those things are votive statues of human beings that are sort of staring back at the viewer, the, the accomplices, you know? And so it becomes a kind of uncomfortable apparition in a collection, you know? So I was interested in, in the possibility of, you know, that object being charged with a certain amount of difficulty you know, um, uh, of the, the difficulty of being collected. I'm interested then, you know, like the British Museum bought the piece and now it's being exhibited alongside their artifacts, which were, many of which were looted, right? Um, and so that kind of tension I'm interested in. I don't think it absolves the British Museum, but those artifacts, if they're not gonna return home, I'd like to see them fuck things up a little bit, you know? So, um, so that for me, uh, maybe doesn't quite answer the question, and I don't know that I'm going to be able to do it on the spot, but like, if I'm thinking about how I address these things, I really would like to, if I'm going to be, uh, you know, approaching power or potentially working with power, I, I want to see those, um, th those moves not reside in a place where, you know, they can be muted and just, um, I don't know, contextualized in, in a, a space where they're not asking questions. Does that make any kind of yeah, sense? No, or? absolutely. And also thinking of the British, uh, of the British Museum is, is, is pro profound intervention as, as you're intervening into the system that actually presents itself as a place uh, that was actually built to educate the British citizens of the superiority of them. Yeah, you know? it's an imperial museum. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in, in the face of, of those who are uncivilized by collecting those artifacts, you know. So, yeah. so for, me, for me, it is incredibly interesting, you know, this, uh, um, the way how you're also positioning your public inter intervention as intervening in these multifaceted ways, you know. Um, economy, publicity, and, and all other kind of like spheres. Yeah, yeah. Now there's a big marketplace kind of emphasis and I'm only first starting to recognize and um, you know the fact that uh, that eBay is one of the sites where I'm kind of popular um, is, uh, is a sort of interesting thing. It's, I, I, eBay for me functions as a, as a search engine as well. You know, like I, I often will go there before I go to Google you know, if there's something I want to know about. Um, because it produces knowledge, and, and like I said, you know, there were no embedded journalists that were telling that story about that helmet, you know, which is almost like an unbelievable story. Um, but then, you know, it kind of, uh, when I showed it in New York, I decided not to show it with the helmet, the actual helmet, so everybody thought I was making it up. And if I'm making it up, it's a really terrible story. I mean, it's like every stupid poster that equated Saddam with Darth Vader. But when it goes that far and you realize that like Uday designs it in 98, it's sort of like, you know, it's seven years after the war. The sanctions are still on and it's sort of like, this is what you think of us? Fine. We'll wear the costume, you know? And, and so, um, you know, for me, the, you know, that, that wouldn't be possible without you know, a certain degree of, um, of deep research into other kinds of journalisms. And it, and it wasn't the mainstream journalism, it was the soldier coming back, you know, and it's not just the sort of typical thing where they say, you know, you didn't see what I saw there. You know, it is like, you really didn't see what I saw there. Yeah. Yeah, perhaps this would be a moment also for us to open up to our audience. for the Istanbul Biennale. Yeah, um, well, uh, is that Doigu? Yeah, Doigu Demir actually was working at SALT when I attempted to do a project that failed um, in some ways, I guess, you know, about the Armenian genocide. Um, and this being the 100 year anniversary, the uh, artistic director, Carolyn Krista Vakarjiev, is, um, 
is, is sort of creating a platform where this is gonna be highlighted um, as an uncomfortable history um, to be dealt with. And uh, so I'm working with a, a Turkish plaster caster who's responsible um, for a lot of the art and deco friezes that one finds throughout the city. And it's an interesting thing, and you can correct me if I'm getting any of this wrong, but I think it was... Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, Kemal Chimbis. Yeah, so, um, so he was apprenticed to an Armenian craftsman in the beginning part of the 20th century. And it was very rare for a Turkish person to be working under an Armenian craftsman. And they, um, the, most of the craftsmen were Armenian. Uh, it was a menial job, you know, it was considered menial to be an architect. And in fact, Mimar Sinan was Armenian. Um, and, uh, and so this, uh, this gentleman, Kamal, was, um, was uh, apprenticed to uh, this, this craftsman named Garabet Chazarlian. And um, there was a fire in Istanbul, right? That uh, burned down a lot of the wooden buildings and they ended up having to build these concrete and, and stone structures. And it wasn't long after the Chicago fire. You know, and I come from, I'm living in Chicago, and so I'm living in like uh, ground zero of the skyscraper that wouldn't have been possible without, without the fire. And um, a lot of those Louis Sullivan buildings also have these beautiful flourishes that look very much like the ones that one finds in, um, in Istanbul. So when, uh, when Kamal was given over to the Armenian craftsman, uh, it's this typical Turkish saying, um, was, uh, was, was uh, almost said like a prayer, the flesh is yours, the bones are ours, uh, which is the, uh, the title of the work. And so I'm gonna be working with this, um, with this, uh, uh, this Turkish descendant, you know, of this, uh, this Armenian plaster caster uh, to make new designs that in one way represent this kind of trauma of Armenian history throughout, um, throughout Istanbul, but to also catalog and migrate his entire collection into a more sort of public setting uh, to highlight his work and his working relationship with, uh, with Garabet. And, um, you know, beyond that, I can't really tell you much more, um, you know, for the sake of keeping certain things under wraps right now, which we're trying to negotiate. But uh, I hope it'll be good. But, you know, it's, uh, for me, a lot of the work that I've engaged with recently, including the project for Documenta, where I reintroduced stone carving into the Bamiyan uh, Valley um, is really about this kind of uh, craft as a, as a resistance to cultural eraser, erasure, you know, which of course finds its way back into the Iraq Museum piece, which finds its way back into Parasite because I was using materials of urgency to make those shelters. So it's a, a meditation on material um, as a way of getting at history that nobody wants to talk about. Do they want to talk about it in Istanbul? You get the idea that they don't want to talk about it, but then I meet people like you and you like talking about it. I mean, you don't like the genocide, obviously, but you don't, you don't mind talking about it. Well, there was a lot of uh, people who attended the marches this, this weekend. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of I think we have, we have some time. We can take another question. Hi, Michael. Um, thank you for a moving presentation, as always. I loved your opening remarks. Um, I just wanted to go back to this idea of ethics again, which was raised. And I always think of your work that I've witnessed in the last 15 years as a practice of um, making visible the problem, as you very clearly stated today and eloquently stated. I'm reminded of Spivak's um, uh, you know, contextualization that I follow, which is rearranging desires. And mm. I liked your talk about your opening remarks about, about redirective practice. Mm -hmm. And I see that as obviously very political and ethical and also very 
um, playful. And recently, Spivak was, uh, I think it was two years ago, she was giving a talk at uh, the Gramsci Museum that Thomas Hirschhorn had built in um, Bronx. Mm. And I was surprised w why, why? Because I was so opposed to that kind of an art project. But I went to understand what does it mean for um, problem making visible a problem and problematizing both the art context as well as the social conditions and what would that be for a, for a cultural critic, writer, philosopher, feminist. And so I was listening to her and she brought up this concept of the gad, gadfly, that the fly that sits on the back of the Horse. Horse. Mm. And that, you know, that this was an important moment in the art to make visible the problem because it's not a solution. Right. It is a problem. But I liked your idea about art being invisible and what you discussed as the role of the troublemaker is as also of, um, as an artist, as a political agent. I don't know if you wanted to reflect a little bit more about this or if anybody else did, but I think these are things that I think about a lot. Mm. Also about the invisibility of the artist's hand. I mean, there's a whole legacy of that, sure. of refusal to make art be co-opted. Sure. But anyway, I'm interested in these thoughts. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I thank you for those comments. I, thinking about um, rearranging desires is a really beautiful way of connecting with that concept of, of redirective practice, and I'll remember that. Um, um, yeah, I, I feel as though, um, you know, simply making the problem visible is not something I, I really want to stop at. You know, I try to create moments where things can evolve and either evolve without me or I maintain a practice where I return to things. Um, I... Um, I have numerous projects that I've tried out several times, you know, uh, and it didn't quite go the way that I wanted it to go uh, the first time around or, you know, like with Return, the project where I reopened my grandfather's import-export company to import the Iraqi dates. The first iterations of that were relatively, you know, they fell short, you know, and it, it was, they were smaller venues. Um, I was not totally clear on what I wanted to do. But then when I won the New York Foundation for the Arts like uh, grant for an architecture and environmental structures, I was like, oh, now I can import dates. And But then NIFA was like, but that's not architecture and environmental structures. And I said, I'll show you how it is. And I sent them a picture of all the date boxes stacked up and bagged out. I was like, that's a structure. Um, you know. And that, you know, you convince people along the way in a circumstance like that, and that's a little bit of a flip story. But if I think about, you know, the ways in which that project kind of connected to an aftermath, um, it's usually intangibles. Like, they're things I can never predict, but I, 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 I'm wholly devoted to an open system. Like, we were talking today about, like, I forget what it was called what Terry Knight introduced us to today, like spatial... Grammar shapes. Grammar shapes. Yeah, and it was really systematic. And on one hand, I liked it. On the other hand, I'm like, well, I'm, I, I'm re I was terrible. Like, they had to... There were people putting together puzzles, and, you know, I, I, you know it's like Scrabble. I'm bad at it. And, and it's a... Uh, you know, even with those shelters, like, you know, there's a great book that's in the MIT library here that has, like... Uh, Thomas Herzog and Friado, and they give you actual patterns on how to make things, and I could never follow them. So my mind doesn't work in this kind of linear way, and so I, I'm, I'm very embracing of an open system that can, can, that can sort of take on its, a, a life of its own. And so with the dates, the dates end up traveling the same path as Iraqi refugees. They actually never arrive, and what ends up coming in is a token, you know? Um, but the dates end up telling the story of Iraqi refugees as they get caught up in the refugee traffic um, coming out of Iraq in 2006. But in the midst of that, and in the aftermath, I started to get emails from American servicemen who were over there 
one of whom actually put together a PowerPoint on my project to present to his commanding officer to ask off of his security patrol so he could go and help the Iraqi date farmers. Um, and then he wanted to find out about setting up his own store uh, afterwards and kept in touch with me and still keeps in touch with me and asked me if the, if the import laws have changed, which sadly they haven't. You know, but you create new agents, I think, when you do these things. I think that like, there's ways in which people find each other and we locate one another in these public acts. And so sometimes those acts of solidarity really aren't symbolic and really aren't just pointing out the problem that sometimes working at a smaller scale you know, enables for people to be able to, uh, to enter into something that doesn't feel as big as a demonstration. Um, and then ends up, you know, continuing to be that gadfly, I guess, you know, annoying the horse until things change. Um, and, you know, and that's why I keep calling these projects ongoing. You know, like I, I still return to them. The, pro the problem hasn't disappeared, so the project isn't going to disappear. It doesn't mean it won't evolve and become a different thing, but, um, but I think that that, that Spivak's uh, use of that, uh, of that illustration is a good one. You also could use the roadrunner, which annoys, you know, just sort of pecks at a rattlesnake until the rattlesnake dies of annoyance. <laughs> and then they eat it. <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe it's a good moment. Well, there's, there's one person. There's one person. Hey. Um, so, speaking about an open system, I'm really interested in how you sort of ascribe or identify or locate your own agency in that. Um, and, you know, particularly thinking about the one thing that humans, like, freak out about with open systems <laughs> is that they're unpredictable. Um, yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, this is what, like, so I study urban planning, right? The last thing we want to do is uh, risk, right? We don't want to risk anything because things are at stake. And I'm wondering how in your work, how do you, like, reconcile with uh, risk and with the inability to predict the unfolding of an open system, mm -hmm. uh, if that matters to you even? Um, but for, you know, how do you sort of create deal with objective, right? Right. Uh, in that kind of scenario. Because I think what you're doing is like true <laughs> in a really fundamental way. Um, and so I'm just wondering how you deal with some of the more like human emotions that go along with handling that, I guess. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, my, my experience with it is to just, you know, to maintain a certain amount of a agility and flexibility. You know, that um, the projects never actually do exactly what I thought they were going to do. Um, they always yield some other kind of uh, knowledge at the end, or they take a turn and something else happens. Um, and, uh, and I think I just don't want to overdetermine anything, especially if it's something that's live and is something that uh, people are coming to. One of the things that Dennis Adams said when I was a student here in an interview was that he believes in a public art that enlists its public or enlists its audience as vital contributors in the construction of meaning or the production of meaning or the creation of meaning, you know? And, um, and for me, this is, uh, this is a really beautiful way of talking about these projects. You know, I have to go slow. You know, a lot of these projects unfold over months and months and months and sometimes years. Um, and, uh, and I think that they're never as interesting you know, when it's just me, you know, and this, in the case in point, the parasite began in a classroom with a bunch of really stupid drawings and architects basically talking each other out of one another's projects and tried to talk me out of my project. And it wasn't until I walked past like, you know, um, that bank that's on the corner of Massachusetts Avenue and the train tracks where I saw a group of homeless men and I showed them the drawings and I said, is this bullshit or can we work on it, you know? And then, you know, once they found out I was an artist, not an architect, because, like, if you're an artist, you're more like them, you know, they, they agreed to work with me. 
you know, and I started to develop it even after the class had moved on, you know. And so I think it's, uh, in some ways, it's like following a curiosity down to its sort of like finest, you know, um, pixel. Um, but at the same time, you know, when you come in with something and you're not just saying like, all right, let's do something together and there's no proposition, I think that as an artist, I have to kind of go in with a proposition and to do something that may get me in trouble, you know, or have people react in a way that they disagree with it. And it's like, well, fine, how do we, how do we fine tune this? And I'm working on something in Cleveland about that right now, which is based on coming up with a proposition that can never actually happen. But then it actually ends up creating a thousand other propositions that the people I talk to end up workshopping with me. You know, and I find that that's the space that I'm interested in. In Sydney, Australia, when I did that project, I faced so much opposition, you know, and it was from the Aboriginal community thinking, here's this white guy, and I'm from the United States, and it's two strikes against me immediately. You know, and I'm going to be like every other journalist who comes through that neighborhood and ends up giving the city uh, ammunition for taking over the central business district and getting rid of their, their Aboriginal housing. And Christoph said to me something to me once when I was here, Christoph Oditschko, and he says, your first task is to survive. So you survive that bombardment or that resistance, and then you come back and you keep coming back and they realize that you're serious, you know? It's a little bit like the gadfly but not being so annoying and not being, you know, um, uh, against it. It's like wanting to, to work with people. And going slow, you know, and not having any kind of preconceived goal. You know, it's like the goals actually are multiple ones. And they keep rewriting themselves because the projects change over time. I don't know if that helps, but yeah, I mean, that kind of fear of risk is one of the reasons why Yona Friedman hasn't designed a city yet. He's going to die soon, so you need to get rid of that risk, that fear of risk. Your urban planners will help that, yeah. I don't know if he's going to die soon, but he's in his 80s, right? Thanks. Um, I was just wondering if you could comment if you heard about um, Joe Gibbons work and most recently being arrested. And I wonder if you could talk about sort of the stakes in, in his piece and in your piece and what the difference is and risk and um, just I'm just curious what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, I, I don't know Joe. Um, I've never worked uh, with him. I've actually never met him. I, I know that he seems to have been a very charismatic and important teacher here. And I'm not going to begin to critique his work or say what mistakes he's made because uh, I don't know. Um, and I think that uh, we as a community should be offering him our support um, because his intentions are, are not what he's being accused of. And I would stand by him the same way that, I st that we all stood beside Steve Kurtz uh, for a different reason in 2004 and onwards when he was uh, being tried under uh, Patriot Act um, laws. And, um, you know, the mistakes are the mistakes. And my mistakes uh, that, I, that I feel like I make are ones where I feel as though I may not have um, go, gone deep enough in terms of my own inquiry or um, I may have been guilty of a project or two where I wasn't able to be there and, um, and the results that were yielded were more experimental and less um, refined and interesting and robust than I would have liked. I think those are the mistakes. I think mistakes in terms of risk. I mean, like I said, I'm not interested in doing something so overt you know, um, I'm interested in more, you know, um, you know, again, like finding a third way, finding another way. Like in, in Bamiyan, uh, the Buddhas of Bamiyan were destroyed in 2001. I was trained as a stone carver when I was in, in high school. 
So age 16, my first stone carving was actually a tribute to the Bamiyan Buddhas. So it was like my art history had collapsed with those Buddhas. And so when I went to Bamiyan, you know, UNESCO says to the citizens of Bamiyan who revered those Buddhas, even though the, the Hazara people are Muslim, that they, they're part of their culture and they, they give them their own meaning, they assign them their own meaning. And UNESCO tells the people there they can't rebuild the Buddhas. They want to rebuild the Buddhas. The, in, the, uh, uh, the International Committee on Monuments and Sites tells them they can't do it. So I said, fuck it. I'm going to go there and I'm going to teach a workshop on, on stone carving and reintroduce this, this, this technique that, that's been absent for 300 years. You know, and then they make their own decision. And the great thing about that is that there is an atelier that's opened up there now by this uh, Afghani stone carver where he's continuing to teach the students and, and other people and they might actually one day decide to carve into the cliffs again. You know, that to me is interesting. You know, but uh, you know, it, there's no reason to stop them you know, from doing it um, and giving them you know, the agency uh, to speak for themselves and not to allow for other people to purportedly speak with this Western, you know, gaze on what uh, Eastern antiquity should, should, should look like. You know, like that, that's, that to me is the stuff that I'm interested in, in engaging with. I'm less interested in me going there and carving it or I don't know what the, what other kind of corollary I can bring up in the context of what I've just said, but like those are the, those are the avenues I'm interested in investigating. I'm not, I'm not interested in, in doing something that's so blatant, I guess. Does that make sense? Or, yeah. Thank you, Michael. Uh, this is the last one, so if we're ending on a sour note, uh, maybe I'll come back next year and fix it or something. <laughs> so, no, yeah. you, brought, yeah. you brought so much, um, so much actually, uh, um, joy and conviviality to this conversation so oh, good. and also the practice that also kind of like well as we're moving towards city cards right we kind of like alluding with that uh, certain energy right and perhaps mm -hmm. that energy comes with, with the choreographic force you know that you kind of like also um unfold with your with your work right you know and not only kind of like uh, trying to um Locate in the in kind of like in in the form as the last act, you know, but but kind of like moving along, right. moving along, and uh, and something that uh, something that starts uh, with the people that you invite, you know, to the work as as making the work happen. Yeah, right? yeah. So so thank you, and you know, uh, at MIT we are talking about energy, and I think art is one of these mysterious territory. Uh, with a lot of sustainable energy. It's a source of sustainable energy. So mm. thank you for contributing to that thank source you. today. Thank you. A lot. Thank you. Thank you.